All right, hello everyone. Welcome to this month's uh, broadcast and edition of the Leonardo Book Club. My name is Erica Ruby. I am the managing editor at Leonardo and I am pleased today to, to uh, introduce today's guests, Stephen Kemper and Rebecca Saita. Uh, Stephen Kemper is a composer, music technologist, and an instrument designer. As a composer, he creates music for acoustic instruments, instruments and computers, musical robots, dance, and video. His interest in music technology centers on the development of technologies that enhance the connectivity between computer-based music and the physical world. His research areas include musical robotics, instrument design, human-computer interaction, gesture and music, and musical expression. Welcome, Stephen. Hello. And I would like to introduce Rebecca Sipis. She is a musicologist and a historical keyboardist and associate professor and associate director of the Department of Music at the Mason Gross School of the Arts. Uh, she's the author of over two dozen peer reviewed articles and book chapters dealing with topics as diverse as the music, history of musical technologies, music and Jewish culture, Baroque performance practices and gender and performance studies in early music. Welcome Rebecca. Thank you. So uh, Stephen and Rebecca are the authors of the um, article, Can Musical Machines Be Expressive? Views from the Enlightenment and Today. This is the featured free download in October's issue of Leonardo Journal. We're very pleased to have published them and uh, offer this article for free to all readers. Um, so please download, read, share if you haven't already. I recommend it highly. Uh, this is why we have featured it this uh, this month. And welcome, Stephen and Rebecca. So I would like to know from you, please um, give me an, an introduction uh, about yourself, your uh, work, and your interest in this topic. How you came to um, to write the article? Sure. Um, Steve, you want to go first? Um, sure. So. Uh, I had been working since around 2007, designing and building robotic instruments, uh, beginning with a group, Expressive Machines Musical Instruments, that I co-founded um, with Troy Rogers and Scott Barton at the University of Virginia. And while working on these instruments and composing new music for these instruments, this, this question came, kept you know, arising from people about, you know, can these, are these machines musically expressive? Um, or you know, people might criticize them as being overly mechanical or something like that. And I felt that it really, you know, while I understood those critiques as a trained musician myself, I always felt that there was some issue with that because I felt like I was getting meaning. There was some engagement happening with these robotic instruments. But um, so I think that's really what led, led me to start thinking about the question of expression and mechanical instruments. Great. So, um, I mean, I, I guess maybe I'm a, a less conventional fit for the Leonardo Journal than Steve might be, but um, he sort of introduced me, I think, to the, um, uh, the, some of the synergies that existed between our two areas of study. So um, when I met Steve, I was working on a book on um, the idea of instruments in early 17th century Italy um, and trying to connect uh, the views of musical instruments with um, instrument technologies more broadly. So this is the age of Galileo, for example. Um, and um, that book, uh, which was published a few years ago, um, I started discussing some of the ideas in it with Steve when we met. And um, the things that he was saying about his work resonated really strongly for me with the things that I was finding in my own work. Um, and then we uh, um, continued our discussions and started thinking about not just early 17th century, but also sort of across the early modern period, how, um, how ideas about instruments and automation uh, and expression might intersect um, with ideas, you know, on similar, in similar lines of thinking um, with the, the work that he was doing. And so um, the case study that uh, that I chose for this article is actually from the Enlightenment period, Enlightenment France, um, late 18th century, and um, Steve again brought brought to bear the the work that he was doing 
um, from his perspective as a technologist and composer working today. Um, and so it's sort of a, a thought experiment in how these different moments in history might inform one another. <clears throat> so the question is, are they expressive? <laughs> your answer, your answer is, can they, can they be expressive? Can they be? Well, I think we would say yes, obviously. Um, the way, the ways in which we think about, um, I mean, I think that the central problem, maybe in both of the case studies that we looked at, is this idea that uh, there is no human involved in the performance when we're dealing with musical automata or dealing with musical robots today. Um, what do we make of this lack of a human performer? Um, and I think that that brings up a lot of questions about how do we think about musical expression. So from the perspective of this case study from 18th century France, um, there actually in some ways is a, um, a performer who sort of underlies um, the actions of this musical automaton. Um, so the idea, uh, I'll maybe just say, say a few words about the case study itself. Um, the technologist involved was um, a, a man by the name of uh, Marie-Dominique Joseph Angramel. So Angramel had this idea um, that you know, there, there's, there are really great composers and great performers who have ideas of musical expression and they communicate so effectively with their listeners, um, but th there's this frustrating thing about music that once you play something um, and it's over, it's lost, right? And it's, you, can't, you can't sort of recapture what happened. It's not like a painting, it's not like a static artwork that just exists there separately, right? This is a problem we're, off, we're all familiar with in dealing with music, but Angramel thought that he had a solution to this problem. Um, so what he tried to do was bring the best composer performers into his workshop and have them play for him. And as they played, he created what he called a notage, a kind of um, uh, an encapsulation that would be fed into, on, on paper, but it would be fed into um, a cylinder, um, essentially the same technology used in music boxes. Um, and it would um, uh, sort of, re the, the machine would use the cylinder and the cylinder roll, his notage, to replay the performance of um, the performance of the expert composer performer who came and played for him. So he actually did this. Um, first, he wrote about it. He wrote his treatise called La Tonotechnie, um, and then he had uh, a, a harpsichordist organist um, named Balbastre, Claude Balbastre, come into his workshop, and they really tried this. So Balbastre took a very simple keyboard piece called a, a romance that he had written. Um, it was not yet published, but would later be published. And Balbastra played it for him. Uh, Dieter, um, Angramel says that Balbastra played it for him multiple times and they timed it so that they got the tempo just right. And his, the notage was able to capture nuances of you know, tempo rubato and timing and all sorts of expressive, what, what were called expressive devices in musical performance. And then the notage um, would sort of act as a mediator between uh, the performer and subsequent, you know, listeners who wanted to hear um, this uh, this romance through the tono technological device that Angramel had made. Um, the problem ar arose when um, Angramel actually made the translation from Balbastre's playing, I think, problem uh, to uh, to his notage. So he captured certain aspects of the performance, um, possibly, especially, you know, things like the timing and tempo rubato, which we expect, uh, we, we think of as very expressive. Um, but he also made, it seems, seems to me like he made some errors, um, especially in the duration of notes, the extent to which they're connected or disconnected, so that the whole thing um, seems very jarring when, when put into practice. Um, but the idea was that there was this performer communicating something, encoding it in the technology, and that would be essentially um, spit out for the listener um, who activated the technology later on. <clears throat> so can you describe the, uh, the machine, the automata that, that they produce to, to create the, um, the expression? I wanted to say recording, but it's not recording the expression. 
Um, sure. I mean, it's, it's essentially, again, the same technology that would be used in, um, uh, in a music box later on. So the cylinder pinning. Um, Steve, do you have um, yeah, let me, uh, the notage there? Let me bring that up if I can. It's a sort of graph. Um, is this? Yeah, any... that's it. So okay. if, you, <laughs> if you look at the very top line um, of what uh, the screen that Steve has just shared, um, it's very small on my device, but that's the that's the melody, right? The right hand part of um, of Balbastra's romance, and then down at the very bottom is his left hand part. You can see those little arpeggios, um, and in between, right off to the side, is like the is the keyboard that shows you kind of what uh, what line of the notage equates with or corresponds to which key on the keyboard. Um, and if you read it, if you read from left to right, um, you sort of tilt your head from left to right, you could see the duration and precise time placement, right? T placement in time for the beginning and ending of each of these notes. Um, and so he, he would feed that through the cylinder mechanism and create, you know, he had his pin cylinder the way that you see in, um, in music boxes. Um, and that was the technology. Um, so there's this mediation, this translation between the musical performance and then this um, this notage that that uh, would ultimately replay, um, record and replay the music. Um, one thing I think that Steve, maybe if you want to just talk about the idea of transitive and intransitive expression, this is clearly a case of transitive expression, right? Sure. And just to quickly mention before that, um, anybody looking at this. Um, image who has experience with contemporary music production will immediately see the similarity between this and the piano roll that is common in it's ubiquitous in digital audio workstations today um, which is a way that we use MIDI to program sound so uh, it's sort of an interesting that this the, to trace back the lineage of that technology and that practice of sort of notating for the machine um, has a long history so this idea of transitive versus intransitive expression, um, I think we can think about transitive expression as the act of a human performer communicating uh, expressive meaning in music to a listener. So the idea that we're translating or transmitting um, expressive content, which can be sort of not it's it's not necessarily well defined people sometimes think about it as emotion so thinking about translating the emotion of the performer to the listener um so that's the idea of transitive expression which i think most of us or many of us still encounter that idea today i mean that's kind of how we are taught to think about performers i think it's how a lot of performers are taught to think about their own performance right you're creating this expressive gestures and translating your ideas to the listener um this idea of intransitive expression which develops throughout the 20th century is based on the idea that the listener themselves is actually producing these sort of responses so this gets into um, ideas about gesture and thinking about musical gesture but the idea that we are as listeners sort of performing what we hear or our senses we're sort of re-performing that in our own minds um, and so the idea of musical expression comes from this self uh, performance in our own minds that we're the ones as listeners producing this sense of expression based on what we listen to and also our musical experiences in history. I also, we, we've talked, Steve, a little bit about the issue of timing, um, you know, parameters of performance like timing or dynamic inflection. Like, oh, if, it, if, a, if something has dynamic inflection, you know, think about like the invention of the piano. Oh, if, if it could have dynamic inflection, then it could be truly expressive, right? Or if, right. if you could capture tempo rubato, that's real expression. Um, but in some ways it's worth like slowing that down a little bit, taking it apart and saying, okay, to what extent does dynamic nuance equate with emotion or emotional expression? Mm -hmm. Right. So, and this is especially true in contemporary musical robotics. Um, it may also, you know, have been a consideration in the creation of musical automata, but this idea of sonic nuance equating to expression. So that if you're building a robotic instrument, 
you can make it more expressive by adding the capabilities for sonic nuance and thus mimicking you know more accurately a human performer and i think that this is something that needs to be unpacked because um designing the capability for a greater level of dynamic range in a robotic instrument um, may give more capabilities, but does it actually make the instrument more expressive? Um, I, would I, just, I think, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity really to invite now our um, audience to chime in. If you have any questions, I, I neglected to mention this earlier. We do want you to um, interact with our guests today. So please do. If you have any questions or comments, please join in. Um, and I just wanted to ask, actually, your last comment, how does that translate to uh, contemporary machines and uh, automata? Right. So I think, you know, one of the issues, I mean, the issue, again, that really sparked this whole thought process for me was criticisms like, oh, these instruments are not expressive. Like, you built a robot, it's, you know, it does something, but it's not expressive. And I felt that if you're going to compare a robotic instrument, you know, maybe a prototype robotic instrument that does certain things well. So uh, as in the case of the musical automata, the idea of timing and precision, you know, that's something that machines can do well. But if you wanna think about um, subtle adjustments of dynamic or rubato or other sort of elements that we think of as being musical, um, it's more challenging. So I felt that to compare robotic instruments with human performers is perhaps not to ask the right question. Um, so the more that I've kind of thought this through and the more that this has impacted my own work, I like the idea of embracing the mechanical nature. So um, these instruments, I mean, the music created for these instruments is created by humans and then translated through this filter of the machine. Um, but by embracing what is with what is mechanical about the instrument, I think we can sort of, we can gain a level of expression as we interact with this machine. Um, so maybe I can, can I play a short video clip? Please. Um, so let's see if I can find it. Um, so this is uh, one of the earlier pieces that I wrote um, for the instrument, the polytangent automatic multi monochord instrument. Um, designed by Expressive Machines Musical Instruments. And in this example, um, you're going to hear uh, trill things, something like trills between the lowest and highest notes and rapid performance and other aspects that maybe more sort of make sense in the context of mechanical music rather than trying to recreate uh, music that would be produced by human performers. Let's see, the volume seems to be low for me. Sorry? The volume is low for me on... Oh, on so we can't hear it, I think. I heard a little bit. You said it's the volume is low? Yeah. Um, let me... Uh, let's see. I think if I... Oh. Um, which, I'm not sure if I can fix that issue. Is it too low to be meaningful? I heard only a little bit, but it was clicking. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually hear anything, Steve. Let's No, is there a, a link maybe that we can share? Um, yeah, let me let me let me find that quickly. Okay. Sorry so about while that. While you're doing that, maybe I'll just add um, that th this idea of embracing the mechanical nature of the instrument is also something that we find um, 
certainly in the 18th century and perhaps also earlier. Um, so there are uh, there's work that's been done by a musicologist named Annette Richards um, about uh, fantasies for mechanical organ by Mozart, um, and part of the the nature of these pieces is that they are simply not playable by a human player, right? And they, in, in, in being, you know, sort of sublimely mechanical, right? She calls this the mechanical sublime. They overwhelm us and they, or they overwhelm the listener and they, uh, they evoke this kind of sublime sentiment. You could see the same thing in the piano roll compositions of Nankaro, um, right? Which are simply not feasible for human players, but there's something in, in a way very moving about that. Thank you for the, the link. I've now pasted sure. it into the <laughs> Facebook chat, um, the Pam Solo take one, and into the Zoom chat. So uh, please take the opportunity to view that maybe after our broadcast is over and, and you can enjoy, um, enjoy that example. So um, I'm asking, what do you think was the reception um, of these early musical instruments or uh, machines? Right. Within, um, within the music community. <laughs> oh, so there, I mean, the musical automata throughout the 18th century were sort of wildly popular and important in the public imagination. And I think that they were part of uh, a move toward public science. Uh, public displays or demonstrations of scientific learning, um, which are, it, it's part of this idea that technology, you know, especially in the, in the 18th century, is seen as an enlightening force, a force for human improvement. So look at what technologists are capable of doing. I think it's why you see uh, people like Benjamin Franklin involved in uh, creating technologies, exploring technologies, inventing musical instruments, right? That kind of, there's this idea that, um, that these things can contribute to society and improve the human condition. This is really before the age when technology started to be thought of as something scary um, or something to be avoided. Um, but um, there were people in the musical community who saw, I guess, who were, who were skeptical of um, musical automata the way that Steve described some people being skeptical of musical robots today, um, right? If you can't make them just like human beings, then how could they possibly be expressive? Um, so one writer who, um, who is a critic of musical automata um, was Johann Joachim Kvantz, who was a flutist and a flute pedagogue. He was, a, um, he was the flute teacher to Frederick the Great of Prussia. Um, and Kvantz was, uh, he, he actually wrote about the musical automata of Jacques Vaucanson, um, which had first been displayed in 1738, but which were, they made tours of Europe and people went, you know, gathered in, in big public squares and centers um, to look at them. And there were, you know, his, uh, his descriptions of the automata were, were published and translated into many languages. So they were sort of very prominent in the public imagination. But Kvantz found the, the performance Right, quote performance to be lacking um, in part because it they just didn't well in part because he thought Vaucanson didn't really know how to play the flute so his flutist was his you know automaton flutist was a fraud um, but in in other ways because um, because they couldn't be as musical as expressive as uh, in the in the specific ways that he was advocating and he actually I mean there's a quote in our paper that I could read if you like. Um, so he says, with, this, <laughs> with skill, a musical machine, he's talking about Bacanson's flute player, could be constructed that would play certain pieces with a quickness and exactitude so remarkable that no human being could equal it either with his fingers or with his tongue. Indeed, it would excite astonishment, but it would never move you. And having heard it several times and understood its construction, you would even cease to be astonished. Accordingly, those who wish to maintain their superiority over the machine and wish to touch people must play each piece with its proper fire. So setting up this idea that I think continues into the 19th century about um, juxtaposing the human and the machine and the human is something that has a soul and it's the like transmission of something from that soul that's what gives music its fire. Um, right. Do you see, oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to ask, do you see um, 
Any parallels or do you have any opinion um, on uh, modern electronic music? I mean, I think that even aside from robotic instruments, I think about this and there are whole genres of music based on machines such as, you know, EDM or hip hop. And certainly devotees of this kind of music, you know, get something out of it that's meaningful. And I think, um, you know, again, this question, I, I think that one of the things at the heart of this is the question of human versus machine. And if you have classically trained musicians who've spent decades working on the craft of performance, um, then to say, oh, I built a machine that can play this instrument, you know, I think that's going to be met with reasonable skepticism. Um, but I think that if we can separate the purposes and directions of mechanical and mechanically based music from music that is performed by humans, um, then maybe there is less cause for wariness. Though there have certainly been cases of, um, so for example, in a lot of Broadway pit orchestras have been reduced in number because uh, virtual instruments have taken the place. So I think, you know, this idea of machines replacing humans, I mean, it's a legitimate question and issue. But I think there's, there's still the potential, which you and other composers are exploring, um, not only to build machines that simply do different things than, and are expressive in different ways um, than human performers might be, um, right? Let robots be robots. Um, right. But, but also the, the in, this interface, obviously there's a huge field um, in terms of the interface between the human performer and um, you know, electronics and uh, you know, programming and interaction with robots and so on. You, know, you could obviously speak much more to that than I can, but I think that um, there is also something about just what is an instrument and is it possible to expand what a piano can do, expand what a violin can do. Um, through technology, um, which is, you know, in the hands of um, a, skilled a skilled composer um, and then partnering with skilled performers, technologists, and so on, um, can be, you know, incredibly expressive and moving. Um, so continue, continue that, uh, that line of thinking, too. So I um, want to, um, I, sorry, I want to keep an eye on the clock. We're coming to the end of our scheduled um, discussion and this has gone really fast. So I, I, I do appreciate so much the, the conversation that we've had. I want to invite, um, again, anyone who's watching, if you have any um, comments or, or questions to share in the last two minutes that we have, please do chime in. Otherwise, um, we, we do um, encourage the discussion to continue in the comments on Facebook um, or on YouTube. This will be archived there afterwards and we do want you to, to continue to discuss and, and maybe debate your ideas of um, musical uh, machines, automata, traditional uh, music, musicianship, um, and any last words from, from you, Stephen and Rebecca? Um, so there's one more link I'd like to share, um, which is, it's a, it's a case study featured in, at the end of the paper, and this is, um, I'll just share the link first, oops, uh, uh, Amorphic Robot Works um, has a project called the Robotic Church, which is located in Red Hook mm. in Brooklyn, and uh, the artist Chico McMurtry has designed and built this entire collection of mechanic robotic performers of various sorts um, that perform this show. But the, the sort of music and movement and gestures of the robots are very much embracing the mechanical. And I think that this is a wonderful example of letting robots be robots, if we want to think about it that way, um, but really just creating this awe-inspiring sort of sense of being invited into the world of machines who are performing. Any last words from you, Rebecca? Um, nothing, nothing substantive, but I just, I think that this is a really, um, for me, very exciting uh, line of thinking in a way, for, as a historian, it's, it's a way for me to, um, to connect work from the past um, with the present moment in what I hope would be a relevant, meaningful way. Um, so. All right. <laughs>
Well, thank you. I want to thank you both very much for being our guests. Um, like I said, this has gone very quickly and, and really a, a, a fascinating discussion that we've had with you. I also want to invite everyone um, as members and viewers of the Leonardo Book Club to get 20% off any journal subscriptions or Leonardo Book Series uh, purchases from the MIT Press using the discount code Leonardo20. And that is for you all as a thanks for participating. And um, please do continue the conversation in the chat, share the videos and download and read the article if you have not yet. Then this is Musical Machines, the expressive views from the Enlightenment and today in the October issue of Leonardo Journal. So thank you very much. I really appreciate everyone's participation today. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.